Hello and welcome to this evening's event, Can We Live Together, which we're proud to be presenting in collaboration with the British Council. My name's Amy Croft and I'm the Curator of Exhibitions and Events for Stowe. For those tuning in with audio only, I can offer this self-description. I'm wearing glasses and a black jumper and I've really done my best to tidy my hair, but due to lockdown and hairdressers being closed, that is a bit of a challenge. Stowe are proud sponsors of the British Pavilion and this evening we're thrilled to be using this virtual platform to bring together speakers from the UK, Sweden and Belgium as well as a truly international audience. So hello and welcome to all. Firstly a quick note about the format of this evening's event. We would love to hear your questions so please do add them into the Q&A section which you'll see in a box on the screen. You can either ask them anonymously or in person, and we will pose as many as we can to the panel towards the end of this evening. This is the second event we've, we've produced with the British Council, and it's really in celebration of the British Pavilion, the Garden of Privatised Delights, which is curated by Manage Verghese and Madeleine Kessler. This evening's discussion draws on the themes of Manage and Madeline's proposal, and also the overarching question, how, how will we live together, which was posed by Hashim Sarkis, the curator of the Biennale. The needs communities have living together in city plans, buildings and um, public spaces are often varied and distinct, and as a manufacturer of a range of materials and systems, we're keen to explore how those how our systems and materials can meet the demands of those specificities while also offering a sense of collective well-being and belonging. This really goes to the heart of our guiding principles as a company, building with conscience. Sarkis' statement calling for a new spatial order sets a very exciting and demanding challenge and Stowe are keen to work hand in hand with architects to achieve the most pressing aspect of living together, finding real world solutions and material, uh, with materials in mind. We're looking forward to unpicking this and with the help of our wonderful panel and our chair for this evening, Severa Davis, Director of Architecture, Design and Fashion at the British Council. Over to Severa. I'd firstly like to thank all of you tuning in and joining us online for this exciting de event developed together with Stowe, exploring perhaps what is the most pressing question of our time, can we live together? As Amy said, this question is an iteration of the central one framing the 17th International Architecture Biennale in Venice, which asks, how do we live together? How will we live together? As many of you know, the Venice Biennale is all about international dialogue and exchange through art and architecture. So very fittingly tonight, through conversation and healthy debate, our distinguished panelists will discuss how cultural identities and histories inform the design process, materiality and form of architecture. This is, of course, relevant not only in the context of the Venice Architecture Biennale, but also to architecture more widely. We all have to navigate our shared future, inhabiting our natural and built environment, and we have to live in the shadow of the COVID-19 global pandemic. A few words about the British Council. For those who may not know, the British Council is the UK's international organization for cultural relations and educational opportunities, arts, culture, education, and language. The pavilion at the Venice Biennale is one of our flagship cultural relations initiatives. The 2021 British Pavilion will invite us to engage in the debate around the privatization of public space in Britain today through the Garden of Privatized Delights. I could say a lot more about this, but I'm very pleased that we have the curators, Manager Verghese and Madeleine Kessler here tonight, so I'd rather you hear it from them. 
That said, I think we can all agree that the issues of public space designed, developed and used is more topical than ever. So we're looking forward to tonight's discussion and of course, to the realization of the pavilion. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Stowe for their support, not only of tonight's event, but their support of the British Pavilion more widely. We're grateful to them and all of the supporters of the British Pavilion. We simply could not make it happen without all of them. So our thanks go out um, to all of them. So now on to our distinguished panel and tonight's discussion. Uh, as Amy said, I'll be moderating tonight, um, but I'll do this shortly uh, after each of our panel panelists opens up with a, a short introduction of who they are. So let's begin. Firstly, Madeleine Kessler and Manajay Verghese are co-founders of Unseen Architecture. They are the curators of the British Pavilion at the 17th International Architecture Biennale in Venice. Madeline, could I ask you to please give a short visual description of yourself and anything else you'd like to add? Yes, of course. Thank you, Savra. Um, hi, I'm Madeline Kester. It's brilliant to be here tonight. Uh, for those tuning in via audio only, um, I'm uh, yeah, I'm sort of a white woman in my early to mid thirties with very long hair, which also needs a haircut. Um, and sitting in front of um, a painting that's sort of brightly coloured abstract um, art. So thank you. I'll, I'll hand over to Manager to do the same. Thanks, Maddie. Um, and thanks, Severa, for the introduction. Um, for my visual self description, I guess I have like mid level uh, black hair and brown eyes. And um, I love wearing color and pattern. So I'm wearing a multicolored jacket and I'm sitting in front of like a big bookshelf full of books. And I have a bit of a problem, buy too many books, like most architects. Thank you, Madeline and Manajay. Our next panelist is Dirk Summers. Dirk is founder of Bowen Vow Architects based in Antwerp. I hope I said that correctly. He teaches regularly and has taken part in multiple international exhibitions. He is a curator of this year's Belgian Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Dirk, could I please ask you to introduce yourself um, for those tuning in? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, hello, Britain, this is Belgium. Um, I'm sitting here in my blue sweater amid shelves of bricks. Sounds, looks like a, an architect's environment, I would say. And I'm still in the office and I'm also wearing a scarf with roses. I notice on the screen. So, um, yes, I, can you, is that enough for you? I'm 45 years old, white, male, sort of, yes, this, this sort of category of, of architects, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <Jared. laughs> no. Thank you, Dirk. And next is Kieran Long. Kieran is director of ArcDes, which is the Swedish Center for Architecture and Design based in Stockholm. Kieran has been a journalist and a curator specializing in architecture and design, and he is a co-commissioner of the Nordic Pavilion coming up for 2021 in Venice. Kieran, could I please ask you to give a description of yourself and anything else you'd like to add? Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, yeah, I'm an increasingly middle-aged white man with a button-down collar shirt and an Irish nose. <laughs> thank you, Kieran. I'm loving these descriptions. Um, so thank you all. Um, welcome to our panel. Um, and let's, let's begin. So we're shortly going to open it up to the audience. Um, I know we have a... Uh, a well-informed and educated and um, lively audience tuning in. So we'll shortly get to the, those questions, but um, just to open it up, um, I'd like to start by asking our panelists, all of whom have a relationship um, with the Venice Architecture Biennale, both in the past and currently to talk a little bit about uh, the work that they're currently uh, preparing or commissioning uh, in Kieran's case. So can I start with you? Madeline and uh, Manajay to describe your the central premise of the British Pavilion and how you developed the idea. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Sabra. So um, the British Pavilion this year is called the Garden of Privatised Delights. Um, and it's inspired by a painting by Hieronymus Bosch called The Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, which is sort of set up as a triptych, um, looking at heaven and hell and, and the middle ground in between. And we've taken that painting and used it as a way to look at privatised public space uh, within the UK, um, looking at the utopia of a commons, the dystopia of utter privatisation, and then this middle ground in between, which we all seem to be living in, um, of privatised public space. And we're exploring that through different themes and rooms in the pavilion, uh, where we're working with some uh, amazing designers, um, including VPPR, who are, who are looking at uh, spaces for teenagers um, and how there's nowhere in the city for young people anymore, and the closure of youth centres, Studio Polpo, um, who are looking at the high streets. Um, then um, Built Works, who are looking at um, Built Works and Public Works, who are both looking at ministries and uh, legislation surrounding uh, privatised public space. Um, and then the decorators who are looking at the pub um, and the closure of, of the public house. Um, and then ourselves as Unseen Architecture who are looking at the Garden Square and how we can better open up uh, sort of pockets of green spaces within our cities. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Manage to explain uh, where our interest in privatised public space uh, really came from. Thanks, Maddie. So, um, yeah, Maddie and I've been interested in the subject for quite a while, and we actually taught a summer school together at the Architectural Association back in 2015, where we were looking at the pub as a positive example of privatized public space. And it's one that's often overlooked. Um, people often think of privatized public space as paved squares and new developments. And actually, it's something that's really embedded historically and culturally in the UK through spaces um, and interiors like the pub. Um, as well as kind of exterior network spaces like the high street. And so we saw the pavilion as an opportunity to kind of delve deeper into some of these topics and, and also question like what's the future of them? Because a lot of these spaces have been under threat for a long time and the pandemic has highlighted inequalities already present in society. And so um, I think while we began by looking at this topic, it's only become more urgent. And um, I guess there's been a a real point um, for us to reflect reflect back on the events of the last year and to think about how to incorporate those into the pavilion. But I think in terms of the, the subject matter, the reason the painting was so useful for us was because we don't want it to become a binary issue where public is good and private is bad. And we need to think of ways to really engage in the middle ground um, between the two and where are the opportunities to kind of rethink privatized public space where the architect can get involved, but also give the public greater agency to determine how best their spaces should be used, accessed, owned. And that's something we're really um, keen to explore more going forward. And yeah, we've been lucky to get to work on it for the last two years with our amazing team. Yeah, so I, I guess Thanks. in summary, um, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> I'll say in summary, our whole concept is looking at proposing strategies for more inclusive access, ownership and use around these spaces. Thank you very much, Madeline and Manajé. Um, no doubt we'll, we'll come back to some of that. I would like to come next to, to Dirk and to pick up on something that Manajé said around drawing on uh, typologies that are, in this case, um, normal in in the UK, uh, Manjay was talking about the pub, and I just wonder, Dirk, if you could tell us about your idea for the um, Belgian pavilion of which you're a curator this year, and particularly maybe how the Belgian, some Belgian cultural norms or a Belgian identity feeds into your idea. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> Belgium is a complicated country, so this year we'll, we'll have the, the Flemish Architecture Institute commissioning um, the pavilion. So every every other, uh, the next, uh, in next, in two years, then we'll have the Walloon uh, part of Belgium commissioning. So, so, so somehow, I'm, it's always a bit unclear whether I'm, I'm representing Belgium or Flanders, but uh, it, 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 um, Anyway, if you will, if you will step into the Belgian pavilion uh, um, somewhere, somewhere later this year, you will find yourself in a in a in a model landscape. It's kind of a fictional sort of urban setting composed out of fifty rather big uh, models. Uh, some of the some of them are like two or even three meters high or long. It's a um, a scale one to fifteen. 
Um, so we've composed this uh, this model landscape um, uh, from a selection of projects in which we uh, distinguished a very nice friction between the informal urban uh, uh, character of our cities and architecture. In a way, uh, we came to the conclusion that 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 the the lack of a strong urban tradition in uh, urban planning tradition in Belgium also triggers. Um, a lot of energy it sparks off a lot of uh, enthusiasm and and ideas in in terms of um, typological uh, programmatic um, 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 exploration so so the, the the this very nice friction of 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 uh, weak urbanism and strong architecture is uh, is is the the topic of um, um of of this model landscape and um so we it's essentially in in italian you could call it the capriccio a fictional landscape and in and in addition uh because of the of the of the delay we also invited 45 foreign architects to to send us a postcard in which they depict the um, you know the, the 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 city they imagine their architecture uh, is part of. I also uh, got a beautiful postcard from Madeline and Manager. Um, many other British uh, architects, by the way, thank you uh, if they're if they happen to be tuned in. But it, it's uh, it's 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 also a way that the, this model landscape, this this capriccio, the postcard. They're also a way to to open up the debate on you know how how architecture essentially. Um, um, wants to be part of the urban landscape and to um, to keep the debate uh, focused also on on the relation of architecture and uh, and urban landscape. It's it's also um, it's also um, was it twenty years ago that we had the the, the Strada Novissima. Um, I know, that's twenty five. I don't know. I, anyway, it's a, it's 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 an anniversary year. And um, and um, well, we just we're just very interested in in um, in many of the topics that the model uh, arise, and I think also in terms of the relation of public programs, uh, public sphere, and private programs, and the and and how how you know the the uh, buildings contribute to the public sphere. I think that's certainly also a topic we share with uh, with the British pavilion. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, I think you've certainly made us all very excited to see uh, the realization of that. Um, and Kieran, uh, may I come to you? Same question, really, um, an overview of the Nordic Pavilion, of which you're a co-commissioner, and perhaps how um, a Nordic identity has informed that, uh, that thinking. Thanks. Yeah, um, super interesting to hear two really amazing pavilions uh, taking shape. Um, and it's fun for me, I should make clear that I'm one of the co-commissioners of the Nordic Pavilion. And the Nordic Pavilion is a kind of curious beast in Venice because it's the only pavilion that's not a nation. It's, uh, it's three countries. Um, I don't know how, how literate the audience is with what's the difference between Scandinavian and Nordic and so on. But the Nordic countries are um, Norway, Sweden and Finland. And the three museums in the three countries co-commission um, the pavilion every, every Venice. Um, in terms of cultural norms, that's one of the most interesting processes. You would think, okay, three Nordic countries known for social justice and general sensibleness, but you couldn't find three more radically different personalities in the room. In my, I remember my first meeting with my Finnish and Norwegian colleagues, thinking, "Wow, okay, this is this this is um, a whole cultural world I didn't didn't know too much about." But four years on, I do, and and a bit more familiar with the Nordic landscape. The project this year is, is um, commissioned by the Norwegian Museum, um, National Museum, and is taken on by Helen and Hard Architects, one of Norway's most important architects, fantastic practice. And they specifically are making an installation, a kind of one-to-one -one fragment of a building they completed two years ago now, 2019, um, in a place called, uh, in Stavanger, um, it's a place called Vindmullabakken. And Vindmullabakken is a, is a co-housing development, developed partly by the architects, actually, on the site of their old office. Two of the architects who are taking charge of the pavilion project this year live in the building and what they're going to make in the pavilion is a fragment of the common areas of this co-housing project the areas in which 
the community of 52 homes shares inside the building. The question, the question they pose in the project is kind of, what are you willing to move out from your private space and into a common space? And what, how does that space look? How can you have a discussion, a democratic discussion about what that space, what role that space plays? How do you share it and manage it in an ongoing way? So as well as being beautiful architecturally and, and an elegant and welcoming, beautiful space, it's also a kind of project about cooperation. And you would say, I suppose, that Scandinavian countries are broadly associated with ideas of cooperation of this kind, ideas of cons reaching consensus and making decisions together. Mm -hmm. And this project is no different, but I think they're also making a series of films as part of the project, which bring up the latent conflicts and disagreements and difficulties in, in making work in this way. Um, so, you know, and perhaps the last thing to say in relation to kind of, what does it say about Nord the Nordic region? I think it's been interesting uh, over the last couple of years um, with Trump and so on, how Sweden in particular, but all the Nordic countries represent some sort of thing for the world, some world where we supposedly everything went right and it really annoys some people. So they constantly sort of victimize Sweden and like, you know, did you see what happened in Sweden last night in you know, this Trump quote? And so in a way, the Nordic Pavilion plays with that, like it both does exactly what you'd expect from the perfect Nordic countries that have social democracy and equality and so on. Um, but also tries to tries to flip it a little bit and mess with it. And I think Helen Hall's project will do that this year. It's going to be um, it'll be really interesting uh, when we all finally get to see it. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I'm really interested in in the overlap in a lot of the ideas that we've just heard about tonight. And I, I'd like to come back to that in a moment as we open up this discussion, not only about um, the pavilions in Venice, but actually what, um, you know, how architecture moves forward. Um, but before I do that, I just following on again, this, this idea of cultural norms, cultural identities, I wonder if um, you could all comment on the materials that um, are the cities and uh, regions that you, cities, regions, countries that you live and work in, um, are how they manifest in the materials that are used in the built environment. Um, Stowe has an interest in materials. I think a lot of people tuning in do. And I'd, I'd be interested a, a comment on that. Um, Dirk, can I start with you, please? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I had, uh, just like, uh, that's your question. Okay, sorry, I didn't, uh, I'll, I'll improvise. I didn't uh, see that coming, but... Um, um, I was just thinking that well well what I what I like about this how will we live together question is that it it also keeps the feet on the ground you know because um how much you know we're we're interested and also puzzled by the whole sustainability question um I'm sometimes a little bit worried that um it it pulls people into a perspective which which is very technical and uh, um, um, a little bit too abstract. Um, so um, what we also try to depict is that the, the, the future city is, is in front of us. If we step out of the door, we are in the city of the future. So, so you know, simple things, you know, like, like taking care of the street, um, considering the relation between building and street, um, retrofitting, proper uh, densifying in a in a in an interesting way i think those those aspects um are 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 really um uh, at the heart of um of of our scenography and i i i i, I think it's also a very it, it's maybe something britain and england share the, the the fact that you know there's a certain um uh, very down to earth uh, idea on on what a good city is. It it's not it's it's not it's not a thing of um, of uh, radical principles or you know or big um, overwhelming uh, systems and ideas. It's it's much more uh, uh, visual. Um, there's a very strong concern for you know for uh, experiential quality texture. Um, so this whole what I like to call a picturesque tradition is certainly something 
which is which which I like to you know pull in from Britain into also always the Belgian discourse on the city because to my feeling it offers a lot of um, a lot of um, um, tools to to work on this um, um, messy urban uh, condition we we find ourselves in 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 Belgium. I don't know if it's really the best answer to your question, but that's what uh, came up uh, to me. Yeah. That's okay. It can't all be scripted, Dirk. We have to we go off piece. That's that's perfectly perfectly fine. Um, yeah. Answer as you will. Um, Manage, could I and and Maddie, but I'll come to Manage first. Could I ask you this the same question? Sort of thinking about that. Um, what informs your your architectural practice and your thinking and um, architectural ideas, particularly using the the UK and uh, as an um, inspiration? Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. I guess specifically around privatized public space, I think we're really interested in the materials that shape the public realm and what they say about you know, who who can come in and use those spaces and who can't and um, privatized public space, uh, I guess, in the way it's, as I talked about previously, it's con conventionally understood as part of like new developments is often like a very hard landscape, which has to do with like maintenance and, um, and control. And often the materiality of that tends to not invite people to stay in those spaces for very long. And and um, also creates like maybe sometimes invisible or visible barriers to access. And so materiality is one of the ways we're really trying to question um, how these spaces can be designed to invite people to stay in them longer um, and how you know we can learn from examples like the pub, you know, where people can spend hours there and it's it, those spaces don't need to just be conceived of as a space for drinking, but traditionally public space has a rich history in the UK of being a place where people can come together and debate different opinions um, and uh, kind of enjoy each other's company. But I mean, or do things like that are more like that are even more important, like protest and um, and, you know, share their opinions with those in power. And so how do we really design these spaces to enable those activities and how privatized public space can can move in that direction so that it's not this highly controlled um, space, but what looks like public space is actually public in its in its appearance, but also in its function is really important to us. And um, yeah, maybe I'll hand over to Maddie to add to that. Yeah, um, I, I guess as a, a practice and also in terms of exploring public space and privatized public space and pavilion, we're really interested in sort of everyday uh, materials um, and sort of materials that you just come across in the street, for example, um, thinking about how sort of the largest public space in most cities is the street. I think in London, sort of 80% of the of the city is streets. Um, and so the smallest of moves and uh, material moves uh, within that realm can really transform your experience of that space. So um, we've seen over the past uh, sort of year, like this massive uptake of using the street for play, for play and there's play streets and how color and super graphics and things like that can really just quite simply transform a space and encourage you to do different types of activities. Um, and I guess looking at how sort of even the smallest of moves with materials can completely transform um, how welcome you feel in a space. So, for example, a timber seat or a timber handrail um, or some, some sort of soft grass to sit on uh, versus sort of really hard uh, concrete surfaces, which might be quite noisy um, uh, for, for some people uh, to be in. And so um, I suppose it's, it's really thinking about how uh, materiality can really um, impact who feels welcome and like they can have access to a space. Um, and yeah, I guess also how uh, sort of materiality can also create types of civic pride um, and people wanting to um, sort of have better upkeep of their spaces, um, how we can, certain materials can encourage nature and rewilding in our cities and, and sort of uh, being quite sort of sympathetic and encouraging of that um, rather than uh, designing sort of against nature, designing to encourage it uh, to come back into our cities. Um, and also thinking about things like signage and how often in public spaces and privatized public spaces, signage can sort of tell you what you can't do, but it doesn't really encourage you to actually do activities and whether there are ways to sort of flip that um, and think about the rules and, and how uh, materiality can sort of 
work um, with that to, I suppose, encourage um, everyone to do different types of activities and start to take greater ownership over their spaces. Thank you uh, both. Um, Kieran, same question. I don't want you to take responsibility for answering that on behalf of all of the Nordic countries. So perhaps uh, you uh, I, I implicitly, do it on... I implicitly represent all the Nordic countries in this, in this talk all at once. Um, now, it's funny, it's interesting hearing Madi and Manajay talk. It makes me think of the kind of epidemic of Chinese granite that arrived in London in the beginning of the 2000s from everything from like um, more London to, you know, that Rogers thing in Paddington. Everything was suddenly granite. And you knew when you were walking off the sandstone streets of like, you know, of, of actual public London and into some other world, Chinese granite. Anyway, we don't have much Chinese granite in Sweden because there's only one there's only one material with moral power in, in Swedish architecture, and that's timber, of course. Everything is, the, the beautiful um, pavilion that we're making, um, that Helen and Hard are making is, of course, in timber, and the building they've made is in timber. Um, Sweden's mostly timber, <laughs> mostly trees. And, it, you know, there's, there's a sort of double-edged um, approach to that material here. One is that it definitely, like I say, it does have some sort of moral power in sustainability terms. Like if you're not making it in timber, you are not a good person. Sustainability, we've taken the technocratic project that Dirk mentions to a real extreme long before I, I got here. I mean, Sweden is a, is a ma mainly technocratic culture when it comes to urban development. And what that leads to is fantastically sophisticated, large scale systems like how to deal with waste and energy that work really, really well, but not much good architecture at the scale of an individual building. It's like the reverse of what, what Dirk is describing. But timber has now turned up as like this massive opportunity for, for the timber industry in Sweden to catch up with Austria and all the other kind of high tech timber um, producers, but also as a kind of as a way as a badge of sustainability, a badge of circularity of, uh, and, and a way to sort of articulate the, the changes that we need to make in, in the built environment in order to, to meet the targets that we've set around sustainability, the very ambitious targets in Sweden. Um, so, so of course, the, the pavilion will be will be mainly timber, um, and you'd be surprised really to walk into a Nordic pavilion that was any other uh, material. Thanks so much, Kieran. Um, so, while our audience is thinking of their questions, so just another question from me, and it it builds on you know on the conversation that we've had so far um, and the overlap of themes that are coming out. In the pavilions, we've talked about privatization of public space. We've talked about cooperation. And Kieran, indeed, you were saying that the, the Nordic Pavilion will also look at this, um, what can be shared and what is private. Um, and, and, and Dirk, your, um, your saying of weak urbanism and strong architecture has really stuck in my mind. And I'd like to ask all of you to comment really on, on what we've all been talking about for the last year and a bit, which is how our built environment might might change in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has thrown into sharp focus this question of how we will live together. And um, you, you will have all been on many panels and probably answered this question many times, but I think we're all, our thinking is evolving in this. And um, I'm interested almost to use this platform as a way of, of having a further discussion on that. See where your thinking is now. Kieran, I'm going to come to you um, first, if you don't mind, put you on the spot. Yeah, by all means. I, I hate this question. The, the, like, what, well, how's COVID going to change the city? Well, I hope not at all. Like, we have to just go back to normal. Like, we can't, we can't let this pandemic thing convince us that public space needs to be less public or that we need to meet each other less. It's, it's ludicrous. Medicine needs to solve it, and we need to go back to thinking about how we fill public spaces with extraordinary activities and extraordinary social life. And, you know, in, in a country like the one I live in now, I mean, Swedes need very little encouragement to stay home and not see anyone. And, and in, this, in this scenario, it's damaged the public realm beyond recognition. It's damaged public institutions like the one I run. It's damaged the high streets, which is dying, you know, even in the center of Stockholm and, of course, around the country. Um, so, you know, my, my view is, you know, we need to go back to normal and we need as architecture, people involved in architecture to say there will be a new, there will be a normal again, because I believe there will be, you know, if we get sucked in by these people who want us to stay at home and turn our homes into workplaces and be constantly connected online, 
you know, we're playing their game. We can't, we can't let them do it. That's my view. Thank you, Kieran. Um, Maddie. Yeah, um, I, I actually hope that things do change, Kieran, um, because I, I think there's been a real heightened awareness of, of the importance of, of access to public space. And I think until now, um, although there has been like it's been known that there's inequality in access to public spaces and access to outdoor spaces and uh, recreational spaces to use, nothing's really been done about it. Whereas I feel like over the past year, that's been really heightened into the public sphere. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that going forward, uh, we'll see more privatised public spaces opening up to allow more people in and becoming more equal um, in the way that they're accessed, uh, used and encouraging community ownership of them. Um, I think there's been some really exciting kind of community led initiatives um, seeing communities uh, take ownership of, of their streets, for example, like the, the play streets. Um, and I think there's also just been this real um, heightened awareness of the importance of uh, green spaces to both our mental and physical health. So I'm, I'm really positive as well in terms of uh, sort of the climate crisis that becoming sort of at, at the core um, of uh, people's thinking going forward, realising the importance um, of the climate around us, because I think when everything sort of stopped, everyone became much more aware um, of their environment. Um, certainly um, in the UK, there's kind of been a huge kind of shift um, in a kind of encouraging to retrofit buildings, for example, over the past year, um, a great campaign led by the AJ looking to engage with policy um, around that and VAT legislation changes. And I think there's been a kind of shift in attitude of people realizing that we're all living and working within a wider network. Um, and so we're, we're living within a wider network of, of the city and the other people around us, but we're also, as architects, we're working within this wider network of politicians, communities, uh, st other stakeholders, and we can't really change anything within our isolated, siloed profession, but working together um, with other people and showing people how we can be um, involved in more strategic decisions and um, other other elements um, of design around the city. Hopefully we can see sort of positive change in these spaces um, opening up. Um, I do totally agree with you about um, not wanting to stay at home working forever and the potential for burnout. Um, and I think within the profession as well, that's like a, a real issue right now. I saw um, earlier today in the AJ, there was a survey um, with part twos, part two architectural assistants. And um, it was really astounding the hours that a lot of them have been working and nearly half of them want to drop out of the profession now, um, which, you know, is really quite like, you know, quite startling and could lead to a massive skill shortage. And, you know, I, I think we do actually need to sit down and address um, this kind of issue of burnout and uh, working conditions and working hours, um, perhaps. But in terms of actually our cities and our public spaces, I really do hope that we see change there. Um, Manche, shall I hand over to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, agree with everything that that you said. And also, I, I think Kieran highlighted that, you know, public space is more important now than ever before, like this need to come together. And also, I think there's a real need to to think of like, if social distancing is a thing going forward um, in the long term, like how do we better design these spaces to allow us to come together more frequently and to do a whole host of activities within them. And I think one of the things that the pandemic really highlighted are these new networks of support. So rather than um, profit or, you know, I, I guess, other like efficiency being the main parameters that govern like the the design of our spaces it should be something about how we actually care for each other or how you know we can actually come together that um that that could be become a new set of value systems and a new set of parameters that should define like how we design these spaces going forward and it's been really interesting all the new initiatives that have come up during the pandemic and maddie spoke to um you know private uh, privatized public spaces opening up and you know there are 300,000 acres of golf courses in the UK and um and those tend to only be able to be used by members and about half of them are owned actually by the crown estate or the public sector and so there were really interesting examples of some of those being opened up during the first lockdown across the UK and then some of them have actually been permanently converted into parks or rewilded into kind of nature sanctuaries and um, it, it probably won't be the case for all of them, but I think that it's really interesting that it's already been a catalyst for some change. 
Um, one of my favorite articles that I read in the last year was by Arundhati Roy in the, I think it was in the FT, saying that um, the pandemic is a portal and like how there's a, an opportunity to break with the past for things that were already broken. And I think the there's been a kind of one way kind of trend to, I guess, the, to, to design cities and 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 um, and spaces that are driven by profit or like about, uh, I, I guess, in terms of like how they can serve people the most efficiently and without thinking of who gets left behind or who gets excluded. And the pandemic has made us think more about like, how do we maybe support some of the like public infrastructure that we really need? How do we get people to use these spaces in more interesting and productive ways? How do we encourage new forms of activities? So I feel quite hopeful that there's like a really interesting future for these spaces and that there there's a way for us to kind of go back to a sense of normal without adopting everything that that entailed. Thanks, Manajay. Um... I know that I've been, I mean, reflecting on this, I've been, it's sort of, we're, we're caught between this moment of what if everything changes and what if nothing changes and how do we sort of hold those things um, and, and as you said, manage a break, break with the past where things haven't worked, but also understand um, what has and, and how we move forward. So that, that's what, what I've been thinking about. Uh, Dirk, may I come to you and then we'll open it up to the audience. Okay. Yes, well, <laughs> imagine you're in a lockdown in Sweden or in England, and then imagine you're in a lockdown in Belgium. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But but um, <laughs> um, what I'm what I'm saying is what's sort of interesting about the situation is, is we're all forced to to live with you know with what we have around us, and um, somehow it made me think of how maybe people experienced cities in the early 20th century or the late 19th century. There was, there was still a lot of attention um, and, and energy and money going into, you know, making cities look attractive. Uh, obviously also a lot of downsides, but, but just the fact that architecture was something which is very much in the center of the, of the public debate somehow I felt it coming back a little bit uh, because people were forced to to just hang around uh, where they live and not to fly to the Mediterranean for the weekend and um, and and somehow just also in the in the outside of the cities the the pathways became you know uh, busy again and 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 discussion of you know uh, accessing nature was was another one so so i really hope this 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 gives a push which which lasts for a while uh into you know um uh, being concerned about our living environment uh, as a as a as a general audience and um that's also in in as as a in, certainly also in our catalog publication of the Biennale, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the policy making, which makes architecture and hence, you know, urban environments more attractive. So we, we have, uh, luckily in Belgium, had uh, an interesting policy choices in, in relation to architecture the past two decades. And a lot of what we're showing is is the result of that. So, so and I, I, I really hope that um, politicians um, uh, um, make more, you know, daring choices in, in respect to architecture, policy, public space, um, concern for the, for the landscape and the, and the experiential qualities of the landscape uh, because of this situation. So, so I hope this, this disadvantage has, has, has uh, at least uh, that advantage. Oh. Thank you, Dirk. I can see that we've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to um, stop asking questions myself now and open it up. Um, in the interest of time, I probably won't ask each of you to respond to every question. Uh, so bear with me as I just uh, fling the questions at you as they come in. Um, our first question is from Nirma Critch. Hi, Nirma. Nice to have you here with us. Um, and it's a question around um, the role of architecture in resolving antisocial behavior um, in our cities. So, Dirk, could I come to you firstly on that, um, the issue of, of architecture's role in, in antisocial behavior? 
Hopefully you have that term in Belgium as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a very culturally, I, I hope I interpret it well, but it's, it's, not a, it's not an easy question. But again, in the, in the, in the let's say, the quality chambers and the legislative uh, aspects of, of making city, it's very good to, you know, to, to, to have these concerns uh, on the table. I, I was also, you know, raised with a lot of this, of these, concerns relating to you know the eyes on the street and uh, the the lively plinth and and uh, um, um, the the you know the the a, a well functioning building line you know very very mainstream fields of knowledge but but it's 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 um, it's certainly uh, i think i think that in the training of architects and in the in the in the in the realization of of urban environments, this 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 is this is something we 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 are good at, um, and and we should be you know we should be in charge. We should claim this domain and make sure it's uh, it's well handled. Actually, that that sort of leads into the next question. I think I might um, sort of combine these and just um, it's a question. Um, I don't sorry, I don't have the the asker's name. But it's a question around um, the role of, of architecture, but also cross-disciplinary collaboration in trying to develop more inclusive spaces. And I think something um, Manage has certainly spoken about tonight, picking up on this, um, you know, how we open up and access and inclusivity. And I think building on the last question around how does that link to issues of antisocial behavior? Um, I'd like to get your viewpoints on that. Um, Maddie, could I come to you on that? Yeah, um, thanks, Evra. I, I think I'm like really obsessed with public toilets. I think it's something that's not spoken about enough because I, I think that we need to understand the infrastructure and networks that sort of allow our cities and public spaces to actually be used by people that give people the freedom to actually go out to access them. And, you know, there's no point in designing a, a really beautiful park if, if there are no toilets or water fountains or, you know, the infrastructure that actually allow people to stay there for, for a few hours. And I think we really saw that in the first lockdown in particular, where um, a lot of public toilets and parks were shut and then you did see people urinating in the parks and you know a lot of more antisocial behavior um, and as soon as the public toilets were opened back up again those uh, problems sort of um, sort of well pretty much you know went back to normal um, and but the closure of the public toilet has been like a huge problem over the past few decades which not really been spoken about that much um, and they, we've seen huge closures of them because of um, councils just not having the funding to keep them open and as a result um, people have begun to sort of rely on a network of toilets in private establishments. Um, but of course you have to firstly feel comfortable enough to go into the cafe or a museum or wherever, wherever it is. And secondly, often you actually have to pay to, to buy something from that cafe in order to use their toilets. Um, and actually sort of our, our interest in the pub and public space, it sort of almost came originally from viewing the modern day pub as the modern day public toilet and with the closure of that seeing even more closure of, of public toilets. And so I absolutely do um, agree with Nurma that I think that um, by sort of thinking more strategically um, about urban design and architecture um, that we can resolve antisocial behavior. Like, um, you know, we can actually, if, if we were to um, sit down and properly have these conversations and talk about these networks that we're relying a lot upon in order to use these spaces and um, sort of think holistically um, about our cities and bring design in a bit earlier um, and as part of policy making um, I think it would have a, a really positive effect um, and then in terms of collaboration I suppose that kind of feeds into it that this these issues they're not just solved um, through an architect designing a toilet, um, they're, they're, they're resolved through like a whole series of conversations of working with planners, um, with the local authorities, um, with even private establishments, perhaps you can fund um, certain uh, things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's working all together really collaboratively. And that's something we've really wanted to do through our projects as well, exploring privatized public space, where we've, from the very beginning, wanted, we've been trying to get different people around the table from landowners to local communities, uh, to elderly people, to young people, 
um, to really understand how it is that we can um, open up our public spaces and what it is the concerns that landowners or people might have over opening them up. And often what we've found is that people share a really common vision, but no one really knows how to get there because everyone's sort of operating these silos. And so um, I think encouraging this collaboration and interdisciplinary kind of working and really listening to one another um, and having these conversations is super important. Thank you, Maddie. Manager, do you want to add anything? Uh, it's okay if you don't. Um, I think just, I mean, on the point of collaboration, I think it's it's um, really important that architects actually like, you know, more and more see themselves as part of like a wider network of like an interdisciplinary conversation and how that can actually engage the public and being part of that conversation and how that conversation becomes more accessible is really important, but also that it doesn't remain in the realm of just words. And there's a, a sense that there's a, like that, that there's a call to action and that things can happen is really important. So I think architects are, are well-trained to be communicators, but too often we celebrate this idea of the architect as this lone figure, you know, kind of operating in isolation when actually like, no project is ever done in isolation and uh, any architectural project is done with a whole host of collaborators and there's a real role for the architect to promote that kind of way of working going forward thanks very much um kieran i guess uh, i'd be interested to hear from you particularly you know with the perspective of um living and working in sweden which is a country that the perception, of course, is that it's um, because of some of the things you were building on talking about before social justice, that it's in, very inclusive. And I wonder if you could comment on um, inclusivity access, particularly as it relates to architecture and the role of, of collaboration in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a big question. I mean, Swedish society is, of course, admirably equal and 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 is built on a constitution that guarantees um, certain rights that doesn't but it's far from perfect of course and the, the divisions in society here are growing as they are in, in many other places and that puts architecture often in an invidious situation an invidious position of, of representing one or other of those extremes we have a kind of slightly depressing public conversation about architecture here which is on the one side um, associated with a kind of radical conservatism that all mo modern architecture and everything after it was a mistake and we should return to some sort of early 20th century European city ideal. Um, and this is a political topic here. One of the things that's interesting about Sweden compared to the UK is that um, politicians campaign on topics we would think of as architecture and de urban design type topics, security in the public realm, how buildings look, individual projects that should be cancelled or not cancelled. The, these, these are kind of political hot topics. Um, the problem is there that very few architects, uh, very few politicians are willing to stand behind a, a, a project of architecture and back it and support it and make it happen. And so architects here are in a very problematic situation. And I should say, just listening to Maddie and manager, super, super sensible and good points. But you should also be careful what you wish for, because if you if you end up in a situation where architects are so collaborative that they are just one consultant amongst many, which is the case in Sweden, they then there then there is no opportunity for them any longer to make any good work. And I think many of the best architects here complain that the contract forms and project management culture that has grown up around the idea of collaboration has actually damaged architecture's place in the in the many disciplines that need to exist to build our cities. So we have social justice, but we don't have very many great architects. And you know, maybe once I don't know if they're mutually exclusive, um, but it's it's a it's a challenging thing. The project, you know, what you what you're describing is the project management culture we have. I mean, there must be another way to arrange it, a kind of collaborative um, way of working that doesn't result in in architects not being able to design anything anymore because somebody's already decided what the layout of the flat should be and a disability consultant has already decided how the ground floor should be laid out and the sustainability consultant has decided what the material should be and the acoustic consultant has decided how thick the wall should be etc etc um, this is a this is a is endemic in in sweden but to just talk on the on the positive side i mean maybe to give a concrete example of a project we did recently which comes back to that scale of the street that you're many of you are talking about we we did a project um, when i arrived in 2017 team here um there had just been sweden's most serious terrorist attack a kind of vehicle born attack down the ma main shopping street here in stockholm which killed i think six people and injured many more um and of course then like in london 
the municipality here um, hired a head of security for the first time. Stockholm had no head of security before that in 2017. Um, and then that head of security, of course, and the whole machine starts buying products from the security industry to put in the streets, to kind of secure the streets. And of course, there's a very strong political impulse to do that. And politicians feel like they're doing the right thing. And we ran a simple design competition or a speculative design competition in, at the museum where we invited designers who were never invited in by the security industry to talk about how bollards should look and how um, what's called infarts hinder how, um, the, the things that stop cars going down streets, how they should look. And we made them at one to one in the real materials and we invited the heads of security for various Nordic countries here. Um, and now they're standing in the street outside, um, as, uh, actually on my street here in the centre of Stockholm. So there's a kind of, you know, and, and that was, and the ones that are out there are actually by an artist, Hilda Hellstrom, she's a fantastic artist, had absolutely no experience of designing in the public realm. And I think one thing that institutions can do, and maybe Biennales can do, is create a kind of production line of talent for designers and architects and artists with the ability to work in the public realm. And I think London has done that rather well. London, since, since Mayor Livingstone, has created a generation of architects who are extremely experienced in dealing with pavements and thresholds and roads and bus stops and, and markets and all of that stuff. We know who many of those great architects are. And I often argue here that we need a similar kind of generation of talent, totally committed to the public realm and operational, both aesthetically and culturally, but also practically about these issues. Thank you, Karen. Yes. That's, um... oh, go, Dirk, go, please go ahead. Yes, no, I think this is, this is a very interesting discussion. Uh, both what uh, manager Madeline uh, say and what what Kieran is saying, what what we what we also try to promote a lot, uh, uh, like um, um, with with uh, with the pavilion um, and the story of, of of the buildings there is is the importance of a strong middle field uh, of um, which 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 uh, should be claimed by architects. Um, so a lot of the of the of the successes um, um, achieved in in Flanders and Belgium on on the level of architecture and planning have have emerged because um, some people in 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 policy making uh, and, and and the government decided to to have this middle field of architects of city architects of uh, quality chambers and uh, just like Kieran uh, you know illustrates how you can intervene as a as a middle field player and to me Kieran you're a middle field player um, in in uh, in these uh, um, in these situations is is super essential um, and I also often tell people my favorite clients are architects um, because you know it's it, it um, the, the, the some of the nicest things things we've designed and built were commissioned by by architects because you know in in the in the middle field um, they really mean a lot to 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 the success um, of of what happens. Um, so it's totally you know uh, underestimated this importance. Also, just to clarify at one point, um, I think uh, I, I totally agreed with Kieran's like cautionary tale that we don't want to give up the agency of the architect to to kind of design. And I think what, what we're trying to say in our project is more that um, we can recognize the wider skill set of the architect and find value in the, in in the role of the architect as a communicator to bring people together without kind of losing that design element and how important that is, I think, to to ensure that architects can get involved in the processes earlier, that you're not just given a bad brief to then, you know, be complicit in something that gets created that is not an inclusive space to start off with. And that actually, if you got involved earlier on in the process to write a better brief, that might be a more effective way of, of um, changing the outcome of a project. And I think that we're trying to think of ways in which the architects can do that and, and like have maybe greater agency in terms of shaping what these spaces in the city become. Yeah, it, it's um, that like often we feel like the profession is quite siloed um, and not really outward looking enough. And so it's in terms of the collaboration, um, it's it's not like to spread ourselves so thin that we end up doing nothing. Um, but yeah, as, as Manager says, it's it's about um, making sure that um, people realize the strategic uh, kind of value we can bring to a project. Often at university, we, we work on all these strategic briefs and projects, and then in practice, um, by the time a project reaches your desk, so many decisions have been made 
and you're like why why is the site even there um and it's trying to make sure that we're embedded from an early enough stage that we can um sort of really uh, make make the best use of our design skills uh, going forward I also think the you know because you mentioned the silos uh, uh, a few times. I, I I think that the the soft power the architect in the middle field has is is really just that that he operates in between those uh, silos. So what you can really see in Belgium is is that you know there is no actual you know legal power uh, amongst uh, people like city architects or quality chambers but they're precisely so good in tackling these complex matters many related to the questions in the in the chat <laughs> this evening um because they are they are they are not they don't fit the silo you know the social safety on the street is a complex matter which which uh, which needs needs someone who can uh, make these connections work Thank you. Thank you all for that uh, rich discussion. Um, we, we have this question from Holly Harrington specifically sort of builds builds on this on this discussion. I'm going to read it out. Um, this is quite long. Um, how can we try to apply foresight to any large changes we make to planning and legislation which will alter and shape our cities and the process of development going forward to ensure we don't create accidental negative outcomes we may be stuck with for a long time. So I think building on um, some of the discussion that was just had around, um, and particularly Kieran's point around, you know, there's lots of regulations which are meant to service the um, sort of the needs and the people, um, but then sometimes the design and the, the other things might might suffer. I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating, but um, I wonder if, um, specifically as it relates to planning and legislation that uh, governs a lot of the way that um, our cities are designed and built. Um, if I could ask you to respond to that. Manager, could I come to you on that? Sure. Um, so I think this is a really interesting question because it's, it's quite complicated in that um, I think on the one hand, like things like planning and legislation, they stick around. Well, they stick around for a long time, so it, they're important to get right. And um, and I think that that for that reason, I think it's right for like Holly's question to be a bit worried about, you know, the the speed with which a piece of legislation might be put through. But um, I think too often, I guess, like things legislation is is created or you know planning policy is put in place maybe without fully testing it out or um seeing where the points of failure are and i think the public sector in general is a bit risk averse so things that could happen maybe quicker tend to be much slower to to like wonder about what they could be before you actually try them out in the city and maddie and i've been really lucky to be invited to lots of conversations around um, what's next for London specifically that the GLA have been organizing um, to, to, to brainstorm ideas for the future of the city and um, what a kind of post-COVID city might look like. And it's been really interesting to hear that many members of the public sector talk about like acting fast, um, testing things out really quickly, and then also failing fast and learning from those mistakes so that rather than waiting to create like the perfect piece of legislation that then it's like you know you're stuck with for a really long time that you just test some ideas out quickly to see actually if they're the right um things to do and then build legislation and policy around that rather than um jumping to formalize something before you've actually understood what the impact of that would be and who it's really for and so we felt quite excited about that kind of attitude entering into how the public sector is responding to the pandemic and thinking about the way cities can evolve going forward so yeah, I think it's an exciting time to be involved in this in the sector to to really reshape like how cities can better serve the citizens, um, but also how the public and private sectors can work together to realize some of these more ambitious projects and what are the kind of changes in policy and legislation that need to happen to enable that. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think there needs to be some foresight into like how the city is actually used and how we can test out some of these ideas before they become um, solidified into law. Yeah, I, I think because um, I mean, there's a real issue that often the easiest thing is to do nothing because everyone's so scared of any kind of backlash if, if they get something wrong, um, which leads to this really risk averse attitude 
um, which doesn't really help anyone. Um, and I think something that's been so refreshing over the past year is to see uh, community groups sort of take uh, greater action and reclaim like parts of their public space and the streets. Um, the Transport for London streetscape plan sort of tested out a load of cycle lanes and widening of pavements. Um, and as Manager was saying, this kind of shift in attitudes um, of the public sector to um, sort of yeah, act fast, think fast, fail fast, as long as they're testing ideas and learning from them, not being quite so scared um, to try and change things. And I think it's just really important uh, we ensure that communities and people are just constantly part of this process. And, um, you know, it, it feels like we're never going to get it right with one or one legislation shift. It's kind of going to be something that just continually evolves. And so if we can break down those steps to allow uh, this continual evolution so we can learn from things and allow change to happen faster um that that feels like a positive thing thanks maddie um karen would you like to comment on that in light I mean, of what yeah, you were I, saying I agree, earlier. With, I agree with what's been said i mean uh, i think um this idea of uh failing fast we must remind ourselves is imported from the tech industry and 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 is like a notion that is built for business um i i can i can certainly agree that there are places and we're, we're indeed like the kind of strategies of strategic design let's say is something we're deeply involved in um as a museum we just made a project with a design practice in stockholm called lundberg design where we've been building prototypes in timber that occupy parking spaces and streets all over stockholm and they build public amenity into those places. And we've been figuring out how to do that as a design problem, but also how to do that as a kind of um, financial model. Like, how do you pay for the, the revenue lost by the, by the municipality from losing that parking space? And how do you make that sort of handshake with the, with the city? And it's been really, really interesting. We've precisely done the kind of build it, talk about it, find out what was wrong, throw it away, build it again. Um, and now we're doing it nationally in, in cities across across Sweden. It definitely has. I mean, the thing that I love the most about that approach is that it gives you the opportunity to have a, have a conversation in real time about something concrete. It's not concrete, it's wood. But, you know, it's something three-dimensional and an experience you're having together. And that is much more difficult to, to have in a conventional consultation process. You know, I mean, I remember being involved in the consultation for the, for the legacy plan for the Olympic Park when I was at the V&A. And I mean, it was ludicrous. We're talking about like a gigantic quarter of the city expressed through one model and a, a group of drawings and only you know people who could be bothered to turn up to talk about it. And this way we had, you know, I remember standing in the street not far from here where one of our prototypes was installed and this elderly couple kind of walk along and this guy shouts, this is just green party propaganda. You're all a bunch of leftist idiot, you know, like literally shouting abuse at the designers in the street. But then when he sat down and we had a conversation about why he hated the Green Party, and it was, of course, because he couldn't park his car on the street anymore, um, we got into kind of what we could actually use that street for and what new amenity we could build into these to the next generation of the prototypes. So there's definitely a strategy that can work, although I, I sort of, I don't know, like the, the sort of boring civic civil servant in me hates the tech industry jargon of it, fail fast. Why should cities fail at all? You know, let's not let them fail at all. Let's, let's just make them good. Hmm. Learn fast. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have another question here from Nadia. Um, it's around, um, she says, I think cities are undergoing a survival of the fittest moment. So what are the things that you think as a panel will become redundant? Um, I think it means um, not just post-COVID, but kind of things that are no longer fit for purpose. Um, Dirk, would you like to answer that first? No, Doesn't look like you I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass the mic to uh, Kieran. <laughs> I've got a specific thought on this actually, just because it's a topic here. I don't know if it's reflected in in Belgium or in um, in London. Even I, I'm not sure, but um, it's very clear in Sweden that like retail is dying as a way to make public life on the street and it's not coming back. So, so the question is kind of, what do you do about the center of cities when retail doesn't exist anymore? I mean, I, I cut my teeth writing about the sort of urban renaissance, Richard Rogers, active ground floors, density served by mixed use. And what mixed use meant was retail mainly. 
And the question of what we do post retail is a really big question. In Sweden, I'm trying to start a discussion as the director of a national museum about the role culture can play there. Like, what, but there are many other amazing new uses um, we could in, we could imagine for the high street, but it has got a hell of a lot of replacing to do. If you take away all the high street multiples on every high street in center in central cities in, in Sweden, you've really got a lot of thousands of square meters to to figure out how you're going to make public, you know, festive, beautiful, joyful, inclusive, all of those things. Like, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, they can't all be fermentation stations and recycling plants. It's like we, we've got to we've got to think of some some new ideas for public life in the city. And I think that's a super exciting task, but I don't really have an easy answer to it. I know that Maddie and Manager have something to say on this, so I'm going to throw it up to the two of them. I'll leave, leave it to you which one wants to answer first. I mean, I can start and Maddie, I'm sure Maddie have loads to add to it, but I think, I think one of the things we're really worried about is the survival of the fittest moment, because the things that are most under threat are probably the things that we need the most, but that were already under threat before. And so like the typologies I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, spaces like on the high street, like, and, and that Kieran just talked about, I think there's a real need to, to rethink what, what are the kind of programs that exist along the high street and how they actually are a way for communities to come together and that they don't need retail as the kind of funding model behind it. And I think that it's a really interesting time to think about that, like a, a practice that's on our team. And um, I'd just like to uh, thank Stowe for hosting this event um, and hopefully we can all come together in Venice at some point during the course of 2021. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thanks to our audience, particularly those of you who have bared with us through the technical difficulties. And uh, on that, I'll say good night and roll credits. <laughs>